So you're planning to attend the APM paper for your upcoming exam setting and you're wondering what exactly has changed in the syllabus and in the exam. Well, if this is the case, then you're in the right place because I'm Vishnu Vijay, a proud Fintrammer, and this is exactly what we will be discussing in this session. But before we deep dive into it, do not forget to subscribe to our channel and click on the bell icon so that you can get updated on the on more informative ACC content. Now, let's get started, shall we? So, what exactly are the changes that will be taking effect from the September 2022 exam setting? Let's take a look at that, shall we? The first thing that we will be looking at here is as to what the old syllabus was. And then let me explain as to what changes has been made here as of now, shall we? So, as you can see here, we have six syllabus areas, isn't it? And even the new uh, version of the syllabus uh, also has six areas, but there are a few minor differences here and there. Okay, folks, so content wise, the content that you've learned up until now is still relevant. However, there are a few uh, additions to be made as well as some deletions to be made as well. Okay, folks, so let's take a look at as to what exactly has changed. The first and foremost thing that you have to understand here is that syllabus part B in the old version, that is impact of risk and uncertainty is now no more. Okay, folks, so have we removed it from the syllabus completely? Not necessarily. Okay, folks, so what has happened was we've merged the topics in relation to risk and uncertainty within syllabus part A. Okay, folks, so it's just a merging uh, uh, activity that has taken place here. There we go. So syllabus part B, I mean, uh, risk and uncertainty is now a part of strategic planning and control. So that's the first aspect of it. Now, secondly, since we don't have any, you know, part B now, the new part B would be the former part C, isn't it? Which is performance management, information systems and developments in technology. This would be the new part B and part C would be strategic performance measurement and D would be performance evaluation and corporate failure. However, the only difference is that we don't have corporate failure anymore, okay, folks? So the topics in relation to corporate failure has been removed completely from the syllabus. Instead, of course, we have a few other new topics which we will take a look at shortly, okay, folks? So don't forget about that. And finally, we still have the, uh, you know, employability and technology skills. But instead of, uh, you know, this, we have another part E added to our syllabus which is the professional skills. Okay, folks. So folks, the APM exam used to have four professional marks available within section A, isn't it? That's how it used to be. But now we have 20 marks available as professional marks for your upcoming AC, AP, APM exam. Okay, folks, and it's applicable for all optional papers as well. So, uh, we will speak more about this particular set of professional skills. But before that, let's take a look at the new syllabus areas once again, shall we? So we have part A, that is strategic planning and control, where we have a few additions to the syllabus. And yet again, the existing syllabus content is still relevant. Okay, folks, so keep this in mind. And what else? Then we have part B, which is performance management information systems and developments in technology where we learn about a lot of technological aspects. And of course, there are a lot of new technological related topics added into this particular syllabus area as well. Okay, folks. And in part C, we have strategic performance measurement. In part D, there is performance evaluations. And part E is professional skills, which has been introduced into the optional papers. And part F is still employability and technology skills. Now, what is part F? all about? Well, this is basically the computer skills that you need to have in order to attend the CBE exam. That's basically all it is. And as for the professional skills, these are basically some, some skills that you need to demonstrate when you write your answer within the CBE in mind. Okay, folks, so that's basically the uh, new syllabus. Now, that's basically the changes in the syllabus and we will get into the addition as well. But before that, let's understand as to what exactly has changed in the exam structure as well, shall we? So when we talk about the exam structure, 
The APM exam is still three hours and 15 minutes. And of course, we have two sections yet again, section A and B. And in section A, we have one 50 mark question, case study question. And in section B, we have two 25 mark case study question as well. However, the only difference is in the structure of the marks. Okay, folks. So in section A, we have a 50 mark question. And out of those 50 marks, 10 marks will now be professional marks. Okay, folks. And this particular professional marks can be in relation to various professional skills such as communication, uh, it could be evaluation, etc. Okay, folks, remember that. And then there is, uh, you know, 40 technical marks, which is still relevant. Of course, our focus should not only be constrained to, you know, the professional marks, isn't it? And remember, guys, the professional marks are not something uh, or you don't have to write something additionally to get these professional marks. It's all about the entire way of presenting your answer to the examiner. Okay, folks, so keep this in mind. So the technical marks are still relevant. And of course, you will have to practice a lot of questions to understand how to score these technical marks as well. Now, moving on to part B, that is uh, the 25 mark question. So for each 25 mark questions, we have 20 marks as technical marks. And then we have five marks as professional marks as well. Okay, folks, so in section B, you have a total of 10 marks available as professional marks and 40 marks available as technical marks, isn't it? So keep this in mind, okay, folks. So that's basically the new exam structure as well. And as for the, you know, professional skills, that is exactly what we will be discussing in a while. But before that, let's take a look at the uh, time allocation aspect, shall we? So. Of course, since there is a change in the exam structure, it definitely does call for a new time allocation or a time strategy as well, isn't it? So let's understand this, shall we? So as always, we'll be dividing the time that we, we will, we're going to take to answer the question into two phases. There is the reading and planning phase, as well as the writing phase as well. Okay, folks. So what do we do in the reading and planning phase? We uh, Read the particular requirement first of all, isn't it? We have to understand what the examiner wants, isn't it? So that's the first step, read the requirement. And then we read the scenario, highlight the relevant points, and then we plan or structure our answer in our heads first of all, isn't it? So that particular aspect is really important when it comes to the new exam. Okay, folks, why exactly is that? As I stated earlier, the professional marks is something that you demonstrate when you present your answer to the examiner, isn't it? So take some time to think what all points are relevant and how can you structure your answer in such a way that you get the professional marks as well. Okay, folks. So that is exactly what uh, you have to keep in mind when considering the uh, uh, considering the new introduction of the professional marks now. Okay, folks. So the new time allocation strategy for section A or the 50 mark question. Let's take a look at that first of all, shall we? So we have 25 minutes allocated to reading and planning, and then an hour and five minutes to write down our answer. Okay, folks. So usually we used to take like 20 minutes to read and plan. So we're taking an additional five minutes to think out or to think out a structure for our answer so that we can, you know, score those professional marks as well. Okay, folks, and, you know, try, try not to take too much time there. That's another uh, effective thing or a point to keep in mind as well. And another really important thing is that you can only become compatible with this particular time strategy if you keep on practicing a lot of questions. Okay, folks, that's yet again another thing to keep in mind. Now, moving on to the next aspect, that is section B. So for each 25 mark questions, you're going to take 15 minutes to read and plan and 30 minutes to write it. As simple as that, isn't it? So yet again, with great practice, you will become a bit more compatible with this particular time allocation strategy as well. Okay, folks. So that's basically a, you know, a small guidance on the time allocation part uh, and moving on to I believe the next area, which you've all been waiting for. That is the professional skills. So the first skill that we're going to look at here is basically communication skill. And then we will talk about commercial acumen and then uh, skepticism as well as analysis and evaluation skill as well. Now, after hearing these set of skills, it's kind of familiar to what we've looked at in uh, the SBL paper, perhaps, isn't it? So 
kind of the same thing, but we're applying it in a different manner when it comes to advanced performance management, or in other words, APM. Okay, folks, so let's take a look at each of these skills one by one. So first of all, we have communication skill, and it's all about clear and providing clear and convincing explanations. Now, what does that mean? Basically means that whenever you're providing your answer, it should be clear, and it should convince the person that you're providing the answer to. And that's not specifically the examiner here, but rather the person within the question itself. For example, when it comes to the APM exam, we have a 50 mark question, isn't it? And that particular 50 mark question is usually addressed to the CEO or board of directors, isn't it? So are we using the language that is appropriate for uh, a CEO? or a board of director member, okay, or, or yeah, I would say, yeah, member of the member of the board. Okay, folks, that's basically the idea here. So provide clear and convincing explanations and respond in a professional manner to the instructions provided in the requirement. Okay, folks, so whatever has been instructed, are we answering to that instruction? Okay, folks, or are we just, you know, bluntly providing all the knowledge that we know? Okay, folks, that's, that's the idea behind uh, demonstrating the communication skill. Okay, folks, so keep this in mind. So, moving on to the next professional skill, that is commercial acumen. And commercial acumen is all about understanding the business and understanding what is good for the business. As simple as that. Okay, folks, so let's uh, deep dive in, shall we? So, you have to demonstrate awareness and show insights. So, what does that mean? Well, the clear idea here is that once you read through the scenario, you should be able to understand what the scenario is all about. You should understand what the business within the question is all about. And then you can you need, you need to show the insights as to where is the organization heading to, if that is you know uh, provided in the instructions. So you need to understand what the impact of certain decisions that is being made within the business would be. Okay, folks, that's basically... Uh, what this point is all about. And the second aspect to it is that you have to identify key issues and use judgment. And of course, it depends upon the uh, particular question that you're tackling itself. Okay, because it all depends upon the scenario and the situations. So if there is any sort of a, uh, issue that you've identified within the scenario, and if you're required to explain on that, do that. Okay, folks, that's basically the idea here. And in certain area, you will also have to use your judgment, your commercial judgment in order to provide recommendations wherever necessary as well. Okay, folks, so that's basically as to what commercial acumen is all about. Okay, folks, so understand the business and try to provide some recommendations, which is good for the business, which can help them uh, to increase their profitability or to achieve their objectives. That's the primary idea here. Now, moving on to the next one. Hey. Sorry to interrupt you here, but I just want to give you an update that Fintram Global has updated all their sessions for the optional papers as per the latest amendments, which takes effect from the September 2022 exam setting. So if you are a student who is looking to attend these sessions for your upcoming exam, then feel free to log on to Fintram.com or call us on the number given below. And if you have any sort of questions, then feel free to shoot them in the comment section as well. So, glad I could inform you about this. Now let's continue with the session. There is skepticism, which is kind of a similar term, especially uh, when you uh, learned about the audit related concepts, isn't it? Professional skepticism. That's kind of the same thing here as well. Okay, folks. So whatever is provided within the scenario, you're not gonna, you know, 100% believe in each and every one of them. Okay, folks, you have to explore the scenario and consider all the information that has been provided within the scenario itself. And then what you have to do is you will have to challenge information wherever necessary. Okay, folks, yet again, we are trying to exercise our judgment here and we're trying to understand as to what can be improved in certain aspects, isn't it? Uh, and we may have to provide some recommendation for certain questions as well. So we're trying to explore through the scenario and try to understand the situation. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna provide an appropriate, uh, I would say solution for the problem that is uh, demonstrated within the scenario. Okay, folks, that's basically what skepticism is all about. Don't just bluntly believe in everything that is provided in the scenario. We will have to challenge the uh, uh, respective person wherever necessary. That's basically the idea here. Okay, folks, and of course, yet again, it depends upon the question entirely. 
And of course, we will be looking at a lot of questions within the, uh, you know, question marathon where we will be uh, deep diving into areas where the professional skills will be demonstrated as well. So don't worry about that. Okay, folks, now moving on to the analysis and evaluation skill. So what is the idea here? So we're going to consider all the information provided within the scenario. And this involves not only the story itself or the story of the scenario itself, but also the appendixes or the, uh, you know, the extract of financial statements or the extract or, or the performance dashboard itself. Okay, folks, we're, we're considering all these information. And then what do we do? We careful, we provide a careful assessment of the scenario. Okay, folks, and what does assessment mean here? Careful assessment is not just to identify the negative points or the issues within the scenario. Okay, folks, careful assessment means we're going to try to understand what are the positives within the scenario as well as the negatives as well. Okay, folks, so considering we have to consider both these aspects. That is what analysis and evaluation skill is all about. So keep this in mind. Okay, folks, so these are like the professional skills. When, uh, which you need to demonstrate when it comes to the APM exam. Now, of course, you will only be able to get a better understanding as to how to demonstrate this once we start practicing questions, isn't it? So we will be definitely be practicing a lot of, you know, 50 mark as well as 25 mark past paper question within the CBE environment itself so that you can understand how to tackle these questions. Okay, folks, so yeah, keep this in mind. Moving on to the next aspect which is basically a topic that has been added to the new syllabus. So folks, this particular topic is a new addition to syllabus area A, where we talk about sustainability. Okay, folks, what is sustainability? It's about taking decisions in the short term without harming the long term, isn't it? That's basically it. It, it, it avoids short termism to a certain extent, isn't it? And of course, it's also uh, much appreciated environmentally as well. Okay, folks, so that's basically the idea here. Now, this particular topic involves the role of a management accountant in the area of sustainability. So what exactly can a management accountant do, you know, to promote the concept of sustainability within an organization? Okay, folks, that's what we can look at in this particular topic. So let's read about it, shall we? Management accountants will apply their skills and competencies to help develop sustainable strategies that are more forward looking about value creation and risk uh, mitigation. So what is the idea here? Who are management accountants and what do they do exactly? Management accountants are do those individuals within the organization which prepares these you know, budgets and they com uh, conduct controlling activities, isn't it? That used to be the only role for these pe people. Okay folks, however, now they will have to, you know, plan ahead in a bit using a bit more uh, advanced techniques as well as advanced uh, concepts or models as well, isn't it? So the scope of management accountants are broadening day by day, okay, folks. So uh, the area of sustainability is since it's a like a hot topic within the industry, then we will have to understand how exactly can a management accountant, what exactly is the role of a management accountant when it comes to this as well. Okay, folks, so as per this particular uh, sentence, a management accountant have to make some plans, isn't it? They have to make some forward looking plans, which can promote two things. One, value creation, and second, mi risk mitigation as well. So what are, what are, what are these, what does these two terms mean exactly? Let's talk about that. Value creation means creating value to the stakeholders of the organization. Okay, folks, and when I say, say stakeholders, it doesn't necessarily mean only the investors, but also the, uh, the external parties to an organization as well. It could be the communities, it could be the employees as well. Okay, folks, primarily, yes, it is the investor or the shareholders. But uh, other than that, there is also other stakeholders uh, for which we have to create value using sustainability as well. Okay, folks, so keep, uh, keep this in mind. And the next aspect is risk mitigation as well. Okay, folks, so by making forward-looking plans or making a, a bit more forward-looking decisions using their skills and competencies, management accountants can mitigate the risks faced by an organization to a certain extent. Okay, folks, so that's basically the idea here. As simple as that. Now, moving on, 
we have another aspect that is management accountants need to ensure that resource is allocated within the finance team and across the organization to engage in ESG issues. What are ESG issues? Environmental, social and governance issues, isn't it? So the uh, management accountants, they need to make sure that the resources, the organization has sufficient level of resources in order to implement these sort of sustainable activities. Okay, folks, so that's basically the uh, simple idea here. And what else? Finally, management accountants will have a significant role in embedding performance measures within the area of sustainability as well. So what's the idea here? Embedding performance measures. Of course, it is an activity of uh, you know management accountants to uh, fix up some key performance indicators and make sure that the organization achieves them, isn't it? So that is exactly the activity here as well, okay, folks. So as we all know, the first step that uh, you know we should do in order to uh, set a KPI or to create a key performance indicator is to have a mission, isn't it? And every organization will have a mission of their own, and it can involve creating value for the investors as well as for the community, etc. Isn't it? It depends upon several organizations, but still, okay, folks. So there is a mission first of all, and there is also objectives and then what we have to do is we have to identify the critical success factors, isn't it? What are the critical success factors in which we have to excel at in order to achieve that objective? This should be identified and then what we do is we set up the key performance indicators to achieve these uh, CSFs or critical success factors, isn't it? So that's basically the idea here. Now. When we set up, uh, so the only difference here is that we have to focus on sustainability as a critical success factor as well. That's the, uh, you know, another aspect of it. And if we set such a critical success factor, then we will effectively have to create some KPIs to make sure that we are achieving that particular, or we are excelling at that particular CSF, isn't it? So that's basically the idea here. Okay, folks, we are setting, we're going to set KPIs in relation to or management accountants will have to set KPIs in relation to sustainability as well. We will, of course, be taking a look at some examples as well. Okay, folks, so let's take a look. So as you can see here, we have four examples given here of KPIs which are in relation to sustainability. First one is regarding materials. And what is the KPI here? Percentage recycled material use. So what's the idea here? We're just making sure or we're just uh, measuring as to whether the organization has reduced wastage by recycling their products or not, isn't it? That's basically just what this particular KPI means. As simple as that. Then there is, of course, CO2 emissions, which you may have heard from several other papers as well, isn't it? And uh, how do we measure uh, or how do we make sure that an organization's CO2 emission has reduced or it has been it, it is being managed appropriately? Well, we can take a look at the carbon footprint. What is a carbon footprint? Basically, the impact created by the organization within the environment. Okay, folks, that's basically the idea here. And the next aspect would be energy and water. Okay, so that's another, uh, I would say, area which where we can, you know, promote some environmental initiatives as well, isn't it? So uh, how can we make sure that the organization is saving energy or conserving water, etc.? Well, we could set a... Uh, KPIs in relation to the energy and water consumption, isn't it? So that's basically uh, another area. And what else? Finally, there is supply chain. Okay, though that's really an interesting area, isn't it? So, you know, to promote sustainability, what can the supply chain do? Or what can what can be a KPI in relation to the supply chain of an organization? Well, here's a KPI presented here: percentage of suppliers that comply with established sustainability strategy. What's the idea here? Whenever you're doing a particular business with an organization, with another organization, there would be some agreements and several policies that both the parties have to agree with, isn't it? So does our agreement have some sustainability or uh, does it have some policies included within, within it that can promote sustainability? That's the first aspect that we look at. And secondly, does the supplier comply with these or have, have they agreed to it or have they agreed to uh, you know, comply with the 
uh, policies that we have set forth. That's basically what we're looking at in this particular key performance indicator, as simple as that. Okay, folks. So these are, these are just some examples. There are several other uh, KPIs that you can think of as well. Okay, folks. And of course, with great practice, uh, you will be you will get a hang of uh, remembering these sort of KPIs as well. Okay, folks. And so now moving on. The management accountant will have an important role in analyzing information to draw out patterns and insights for those who use the information. So folks, the management accountant's role is not just constrained to setting these KPIs, but they're also gonna measure these KPIs as well, isn't it? So they set the KPIs, measure them, and what else? They also report on them, or in other words, they control the performance using these KPIs as well. Okay, folks? So that's basically another function that management accountants have in relation to, of course, sustainability and I would say overall for the entire organization as well since you know uh, they set KPIs not just for sustainability but for the organization's profitability and various other aspects as well as it so keep this in mind okay folks moving on so yeah this particular aspect uh, entails the uh, measuring part or measuring phase when it comes to uh, the KPI process that's basically it so they analyze the information that they've obtained and then they provide insights identify patterns and make uh you know and use this information to make good decisions for the organization okay folks so moving on to the next part that is reporting and controlling the performance so as i stated earlier the management accountants set the kpis they measure the kpis and now they're controlling performance using the information that they've gathered so let's take a look at this shall we so the management accountant will have a role in reporting and controlling performance. And how do they do this exactly? They compare the actual figures or the actual measures with the target or benchmarks. Okay, folks, that's one thing. However, there's a slight problem there, but uh, especially when it comes to sustainability, that's basically because there won't be much benchmarks available. There could be, but there uh, most probably won't be. Okay, folks, because there's no standardized approach or standardized measures or KPIs in relation to sustainable aspects at the moment. It could come up maybe in the near future, but at the moment there is no such thing. So it would be difficult to identify a benchmark. That's just a possibility. Okay, folks. And what else? Monitoring performance consistently over time and identifying trends. Yet again, so we're gonna, you know, we're not gonna, this is not a one time process. We're gonna continuously monitor the performance or monitor the, measure the KPIs again and again and identify a pattern in that, okay folks? And then try to predict as to what's gonna happen in the future and what can be, uh, what all corrective actions can we take, etc. Okay folks, there's a lot of process into that. And what else? Investigating the difference between actual and target performance and making recommendations to get back on track. As I stated earlier, if there is any sort of, let's say, adverse variances in these KPIs, if we, make, if we have not achieved the target, why hasn't that happened? This particular aspect should be investigated, isn't it? So this will be investigated and uh, the management accountants will take corrective action to mitigate this adverse variance, okay folks, or they, they'll try to convert it into a favorable, favorable variance as well. Okay folks, remember that. <clears throat> And what else? Communicating insights in an objective and responsible way to influence the organization's decision making. All right. So what's the idea here? Well, basically, they communicate or they use this particular information that they gathered when measuring the performance and make good decisions for the organization. That's basically the idea here. Management accountants are always forward looking people, isn't it? So they will have to make some expectations of as to what can happen within the industry if we make a particular decision, isn't it? So just like that, they use the sustainability related information and then they, uh, you know, provide some insights to the key executives as well as the key personnel within the organization so that they can take, uh, uh, they, can, they can add value to the organization as well as to the uh, uh, you know, uh, to the entire stakeholders as well. Okay, folks, so that's basically the idea here. And finally, we have helping apply these decisions to harness value for the organizations. 
So they, they don't just provide some recommendations to the key executives regarding, you know, what can happen or uh, this is the patterns of trends that we identified. We don't, we don't just showcase that, but we also help them into uh, applying the decisions that the key executive takes to various levels of the organization as well. Okay, folks, so that's basically the final point here. We not only provide insights from the data that we've gathered, because we're not just, you know, uh, uh, data scientists or data analysts, but we're also helping them into uh, applying the decisions that the key executive have taken, or uh, they, they help the key executive take corrective action or enable, enable the uh, organization to implement the decisions taken by the key executives or the top level management, in other words. Okay, folks, so that's basically the idea here. Now, that's all for the uh, topics in relation to sustainability. Now, moving on to another syllabus area or another topic, which is added to uh, syllabus part B. Okay, folks, so this is kind of a, I would say a technological uh, syllabus area. And why exactly is that? Well, there are a few technical topics, new technical topics that has been added in relation to big data as well as data analytics. So let's take a look at each of these one by one, shall we? So first of all, we have data silos. So what are data silos anyway? Let me illustrate this within an example. So let's say that we have an organization that is ABC Co. And our primary focus is on two departments of ABC Co. That is the sales as well as marketing. So they have two departments and the idea behind both these departments would be that they would have some common data available to both these departments, isn't it? Ideally, there should be, isn't it? Because they, they're both focused on the customer itself. So I want to give you an example here. Let's say that we have customer data. Okay, folks, customer data is something that both these departments would be interested in. So let's say that the marketing department has access to this particular data, but the sales department doesn't. So what should the sales department do? Well, they will have to recreate the same data yet again, either manually or they will have to, uh, you know, uh, go, go to the marketing department and request for it, isn't it? Which is, in a way, a time consuming process, isn't it? There could be some formalities regarding com uh, communication between departments or team members, isn't it? And uh, it won't be, it may not be available to the sales department at the right time. There could be some delays occurring, isn't it? So that's a possibility. So data silos is arised in such a, a scenario. Okay, folks, it is basically when data is available to one department, but not available to the other. Okay, folks, that's basically the idea here. Now, let's uh, deep dive into that, shall we? So let's read the definition first of all. A data silo is when data exists in separate areas of the organization or in separate information system and does not connect up with or integrate with organizational data or information systems. Okay, folks. So data silos occur especially in organizations where they don't have a common database to put their data in. That's basically the idea here. Okay, folks, if organization does not have a common place, such as, let's say, a cloud uh, uh, storage or uh, maybe a unified corporate database, if, if, they, if the organization does not have these, then there, there are chances that there will be data silos, that, which is basically the data that is available to one department, but it's, it's not made available to the other, even though they need it. Okay, folks, so that's basically the idea here. So, the problem with data silos is that the data silo may result in duplication of information. Now, in this scenario that we've looked at, what's going to happen here? The marketing data has the access to customer data. However, the sales department doesn't, isn't it? So they cannot access the same data right here. So what they will have to do is they will have to recreate this data once again, isn't it? And that is basically duplication of work. Okay, folks, so that's basically the idea behind data solutions. It, it, it creates duplication of work. And 
Another problem would be that it creates barrier to collaboration and coordination. So, as of now, we are looking at we are looking at a functional structure, isn't it? The organization ABC, ABC Co is divided based on various functions such as HR, finance, uh, as well as accounting or uh, yeah, sales and marketing as well. However, I want you to consider a different organization, like a divisionalized organization. In a divisionalized organization, what would be the uh, idea there? Well, let's say that uh, there is another organization. <clears throat> let's say XYZ Co. And they have several product lines. Okay, folks. So each department would be a product line, isn't it? So there would be product one, product two, and then product three. So we they each of these you know departments or each of these uh you know product lines may use some sort of similar information here and there however due to let's say competition aspects they may not you know collaborate with each other isn't it so that's basically another situation where data silos can create problems okay folks unless we have a unified corporate database it prevents teams from collaborating with each other due to various competition related aspects. Okay, folks, so that's basically another, uh, I would say, <clears throat> problem that data silos creates. Well, we've identified a problem. We've learned about a problem. Now let's learn about the solution, shall we? So what would be the solution here? How can we prevent data silos from occurring within the organization? Kind of a simple uh, solution, really. All we have to do is we just have to introduce cloud storage technology or a unified corporate database within the organization or to put it in, in into like really specific words there should be data integration so that the right team can get the right information at the right time and use them appropriately okay folks so that's basically the idea here so that is, basic, that is basically as to what data silos is all about and what, what the problem it causes and the solution to it as well. Okay, folks, and data integration is basically, uh, you know, uh, integrating the information, integrating the data into a single database so that everyone has access to it. Okay, folks, that's basically the common concept here. And we can use that using various IT technologies such as cloud storage or unified corporate database as well. Okay, folks, so remember that. Now, moving on to the next aspect that is, some new IT developments. Okay, folks, so technologically, there are a lot of innovative developments happening in the industry, isn't it? And we as accountants should be updated regarding these as well. Okay, folks, so let's take a look at each of these developments one by one. We've already learned about some new IT developments such as the unified corporate database or network technology as well as cloud technology as well as uh, RFID tags as well, isn't it? So there are a few more things that you have to keep an understanding of. And the first thing would be process automation. Now, when we talk about process auto automation, it's just a simple concept. It's basically replacing manual labor with technology. That's basically all it is. So let's read through it, shall we? Process automation is a technology enabled automation of business processes, which were previously carried out manually, as simple as that. Okay, folks so previously it was a manual process now it's automated for example let's take that let's say that within an organization there was someone who used to send out an email to the particular suppliers whenever there was a shortage of inventory but now this process can be replaced by an automated system isn't it so that's basically the idea here okay, folks, it's just a simple example for uh, process automation and uh, another aspect of process automation is that it can be the entire process itself or it can also be elements within that as well okay folks so we cannot automate the entire inventory management on its own why exactly is that because yeah we may have a software which can point out as to whether the inventory is running out or not however the physical movement of inventory still requires manual labor isn't it so that's basically the idea here okay folks so that's basically just what process automation is all about and another uh, really interesting area is the internet of things as well and this is yet again a, a really interesting area as well let's take a look 
The Internet of Things describes the network of smart devices with inbuilt software and connectivity to the internet, allowing them to constantly monitor and exchange data. Well, there's always a simple example, uh, you know, available for this as well. Okay, folks. So nowadays we have smart houses, isn't it? So what is a smart house anyway? So this this is a house where uh, you know we have a lot of home appliances connected to uh, connected in a network, isn't it? So that's basically the idea here. So they may have uh, perhaps an Alexa or any sort of uh, devices similar to that. And this particular device would be connected to the washing machine or to the lights within the house itself. And we can just, uh, you know, command that particular system to turn, so turn on the lights or turn off the lights as well, isn't it? So that's basically the idea here. Okay, folks. So it's basically an interconnected uh, set of devices, set of smart devices, which, you know, we use to make our lives easier. That's basically all it is. Okay, folks. Moving on to the next aspect that is, Artificial intelligence. So folks, this particular concept might be a bit too exaggerated by a lot of Hollywood movies out there, but the concept is kind of similar and kind of simple as well. Okay, folks? So it's all about developing human thinking within machines or softwares to be exact. Okay, folks? So artificial intelligence has, I would say, two subset to it. Okay, folks? The first subset involves software. Okay, folks, there are softwares which has a thinking capability, which learns from experience. That's basically one aspect to it. And then there are machines, hardware, okay, folks, which you can, uh, you know, there's a, you know, robots and things like that. That's basically as to what it is. So when it comes to machines, or uh, there's a concept known as machine learning, which is like a subset of uh, artificial intelligence, but more than about that, Artificial intelligence is an area of computer science that works on creating softwares and machines, softwares and machines that works and interacts like human beings. Okay, folks, so softwares and machines with human thinking capabilities. That's basically it. However, at this moment, we do not have any, you know, softwares or machines that can think themselves. Okay, folks, it's all programmed in there. And uh, yeah. A self-thinking like software or machines is still, you know, uh, still a myth to us. Okay, folks, so keep this in mind. Now, uh, but there are a lot of, you know, uh, softwares which use AI and a lot of brilliant softwares as well. So, okay, folks, and we use those within the, uh, you know, accounting industry or audit industries or various other industries as well. Okay, folks, remember that. So these softwares or machines correctly interpret. So what do they do exactly? So what they're going to do is they're going to interpret external data. They will learn such data and use those learnings to achieve specific goals as well as tasks. Okay, folks, so this is basically what the uh, software does. Okay, folks, it, it captures the external data, understands or learns from it, and then they use the particular learnings that they've achieved to achieve certain tasks or to achieve certain goals. Okay, folks, so that's basically the idea here. It's it's kind of a vague statement because, you know, uh, it depends upon different situations and different industries and different, there are a lot of different uses for this as well. But primarily, uh, we're just focusing on as to what the concept is, okay, folks? So that whenever, uh, you know, a, a scenario arises, we can perhaps recommend it there, isn't it? So that's basically the idea here. Okay, folks, so moving on to another syllabus area which has been added to syllabus area B, which is method of data analytics. So when it comes to data analytics, there are various methods through which we can conduct this activity. Okay, folks, that is exactly what we are going to look into in this particular area. But there are especially four methods primarily. First method involves descriptive method or descriptive data analytics. What does that mean? Well, all we have to do is we just have to ask the question, what has happened? Okay, folks. So as the name suggests, we or as the question suggests, we're looking at historical data. We collect it, organize it, and present it in an understandable manner so that we can, you know, make, uh, we, we can have a good set of information to take decisions. Okay, folks, so that's basically the idea here. So it's like the starting point, we collect, organize and present historical data. 
in an understandable manner. And why do we do this? So that we have a good set of information to take a good set of decisions. Okay, folks, so that's basically the idea here. And then we have diagnostic data analytics as well. So what is this all about? Here, we're going to ask the question, why did it happen? Okay, folks, so we're not just going to collect and organize the data, but we're also going to analyze the data as well. Okay, folks, so this involves analyzing the data to find connections between different sets of data. So we analyze it, identify patterns and trends within it. Within what? Within historical data yet again. Okay, folks, so that's basically the idea here. Now, that's basically the second method. And then we also have, now, if you look at these two methods that we just discussed, it's more backward looking than forward looking, isn't it? I mean, it deals with historical data rather than the current data or the futuristic uh, data that we could collect as well, isn't it? So that's basically the idea here. Okay, folks, the first two methods are more backward looking, whereas the next two methods are a bit more forward looking as well. Okay, folks, so let's take a look at the next method that is predictive data analytics. So what is predictive all about? So when it comes to predictive data analytics, it's all about what will happen next, as the name suggests, isn't it? So this involves using historical and current data to predict how things may unfold in particular areas of the business, allowing organizations to develop initiatives to enhance performance. So what's the idea here, guys? We're going to use the historical data and the current data. Yes, we do use it. However, we use it to make predictions of what's going to happen in the future. Okay, folks, so that's basically the idea here. And of course, it's kind of like what, what we would do in, let's say, you know, stock trading or options trading, etc. Okay, folks, what do we do there? We just read charts and then we uh, like predict as to what, uh, as to whether the, you know, sh share price is going to go up or down, isn't it? So that's basically the uh, idea here. That's basically that's what predictive data analytics is all about. Okay, folks. Now, moving on to another, uh, a bit more advanced version of uh, predictive analysis, I would say. It's prescriptive analysis. Okay, folks, what is this all about? Well, this involves combining predictive analysis with AI. What is AI? Artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms to anticipate what, when, and importantly, why something might happen. Okay, folks, so what do we do here? It's kind of similar to predictive analysis, but we just use artificial intelligence here. Okay, folks, so that's basically the only difference. And why do we use artificial intelligence? To understand, uh, you know, what's gonna happen, or uh, when is it gonna happen, and more importantly, why is it happening? Because if we know the why aspect, we can understand, or we can try to, if it is a bad thing, we can try to, you know, uh, avoid it or reduce it to a certain extent as well, isn't it? So that's basically the idea here. Okay, folks, so we can perhaps use prescriptive analysis to foresee certain risks that can happen in the future. And if that happens, then if we understand why that risk is occurring, then definitely we can take, take initiatives to either reduce the risk or avoid the risk, isn't it? So that's basically the idea here. Okay, folks, so these are some examples of, or these are some methods of data analytics. And as I stated earlier, the first two methods, that is descriptive and diagnostic, is more backward looking, whereas predictive and prescriptive is more forward looking as well. Okay, folks, so keep this in mind. Now, moving on to some alternative methods of data analytics. And this is yet again an interesting set of analytics. The first one is text analytics. So as the name suggests, what we're going to do is we're going to analyze the text within in various source. It could be, let's say, feedback forms provided from the customers. It could be uh, emails provided from suppliers or various other customers, etc. It could be anything, okay, folks? Uh, it could even be like Twitter messages as well, okay, folks? So what we're going to do is we're going to analyze the particular things and obtain valuable information from it so that we can take good decisions for the organization. That's basically all it is, okay, folks? And of course, uh, as to what exactly would the information be? Well, that'll depend upon the purpose itself. Okay, folks, if the purpose is, uh, let's say, in relation to uh, conduct marketing in a bit more better manner, then uh, 
we might you know obtain some details in relation to what are the customer preferences from these sort of things things like that okay folks that's basically the idea here regarding text analytics so let's take a look at that the existing text okay folks so the existing text which is obtained from various sources for example customer feedback questions or other comments provided from you know various sources are analyzed to obtain valuable insights so we may take a look at the comments provided within our let's say organization's website to get valuable information as to how the you know public views us or things like that okay folks, that, that's just an example as to how we use text analytic that's basically all it is a simple process and then there is image analytic as well and i'm not talking about the you know intangible uh, i would say reputation or anything like that it's just a plain old digital image as simple as that okay folks so this is the extraction of useful information from mainly digital images and what is a digital image well, this is basically an image created by the com uh, a computer system. Okay, folks, that's basically all it is. For example, barcodes or QR codes, etc. That's basically all that is. And image analysis technology has a variety of uses. For example, you know, scanning barcodes or QR codes. That's basically all it is. This particular code will have a lot of information. Okay, folks, let's say that I have, uh, I can provide like, uh, let's say 10 paragraph worth of information to the customers. But I can't just, you know, uh, mention everything within the package or package itself, isn't it? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to include a QR code so that the customer can scan that particular thing and go to my website and read about the product. Okay, folks, so that's basically, uh, you know, an example usage of this particular process as simple as that. So we're making, we're just making the, you know, lives of the customers as well as ourselves easier with this, isn't it? So that's basically all it is. And then there is also video analytic as well. And what's the idea here? It's basically gaining insights or valuable information through historical or real time video. Okay, folks, by analyzing historical or historical basically means recorded or real time live video as well. Okay, folks, watching like CCTV footages or uh, yeah, uh, perhaps like traffic police looking at the you know live cameras or things like that. Okay, folks, speeding tickets, etc. So all these things come under video analytics. It's a simple thing. Okay, folks, and then we have voice analytic as well. And what is voice analytic all about? So you may you may receive like phone calls from call centers, isn't it? So what they're gonna do is they they might some of them might you know say that they will be recording the call for training purposes or things like that, isn't it? So that's basically, uh, this is basically why they use it. They try to analyze your, let's say, uh, you know, uh, your preferences that you you may have, uh, you know, talked about, talk, uh, talk to the sales executive or things like that. And then they use it to gain valuable insights. Okay, folks, so that's basically the idea here. So voice analytics software can be used automatically, can be used to automatically identify and analyze speech, including words and phrases. And then yet again, the end of the day, the primary objective is to gain valuable insights, isn't it? As simple as that. Okay, folks. So yeah, moving on to another uh, aspect as well. So this is kind of similar to voice analytics as well. It's called sentimental analytics or opinion mining. Now, what's the idea here? This is the process of determining the emotional tone behind a series of words to gain understanding of attitude opinions and emotions so <clears throat> let me give an example here it's not just the voice that we're looking at here okay folks it could be anything well uh, i'll give you two examples here the first example is when uh, someone has provided a comment within the organization's website okay folks be it any organization so the comment was the product or the products provided by this organizations are really let's say awesome okay folks let, let, let's say that that's that's the comment provided now is that actually a positive comment was it provided by a verified uh, i would say person or was is it is it just you know uh, some uh, like unknown person behind it or uh, was it sarcasm perhaps so this is this is what we're going to do in sentiment analysis we're trying to identify what was the intention of the person who has provided the comment 
is he looking forward to buy something new from us or is he is he uh, like uh, is his objective to get more discounts from us so this is basically the uh, you know uh, one example and another example is as I've stated earlier you get you, you will receive calls from call centers perhaps and yet again they might record the particular uh, call and why do they do this for training purposes and in training what do they do they try to analyze your voice tone and understand as to whether you are angry or whether you are interested in what they're selling or uh, are you just you know are you are, or do you just want to like uh, get it avoided with or things like that okay folks so that's basically some examples of sentiment analysis we're trying to understand what the party wants through their emotions through their opinions etc okay folks as simple as that now moving on to another topic so this particular topic is regarding the ethical aspects behind big data and data analytics and again in addition to part uh, b okay folks so what's the big idea here well, when we talk about big data or data analytics, what's the, what, what is the issue regarding these? There are two main issues. One, we have a huge set of data, sometimes even unwanted data, isn't it? That's a possibility. That's a, a possible demerit, I would say. And secondly, there could be privacy issues, isn't it? Because some of these data could be personal details of certain individuals. So that's basically the idea here okay folks so there could be privacy issues or there could be misuse of data when it comes to anal data analytics okay folks that's basically uh, why we are taking a look at ethical issues in relation to this now let's take a look at it shall we ethical issues associated with information collection and processing well when we talk about this particular topic, there are several rules and regulations introduced by governments around the world to uh, in relation to data protection and privacy as well. Okay, folks. So there are such rules, but there are still you know some issues, uh, security issues that uh, that uh, we stay we face even now. Okay, folks. Now, when it comes to the first act that we're going to learn here, we're going to learn about the GDPR or General Data Protection Regulation. Okay, folks. So the GDPR Act is basically uh, implemented for the United Kingdom as well as the European Union as well. Okay, folks, that's where uh, it takes effect. It was introduced in 2018, but the history is not that important. Okay, folks, however, what's more important is why we, or what does this act, uh, you know, what does it detail? What does it entail exactly? Let's take a look at that, shall we? The legislation details the following principles about data. The first thing is that you should fairly, lawfully, and transparently use the particular data. Okay, folks. So the usage of data should be fair, lawful, and transparent. As simple as that. Okay, folks. It should be used in a fair manner, especially you know. Uh, if you if you have some sort of like personal details of individuals, then you should not like uh, transfer it to unknown uh, person personnel or something like that. Okay, folks. And then uh, whatever you are or whatever data that you are collecting, it should be transparent to all uh, individuals. So it, it should be made transparent. Okay, folks. It should be clear process. There should not be any uh, uh, unknowingly or illegal misuse of data. That's basically all it is. And what else? should be used to use for specific or explicit purposes okay folks there should be an intention of using the data or collect for collecting information as well and it should be for a purpose that is known by the individual from which we're collecting the data as well okay folks so that's basically the second point and what else <clears throat> should be used in a way that is adequate relevant and limited to only what is necessary so you shouldn't you shouldn't just uh, you know go ahead and uh, collect data entirely or collect un unnecessary data just uh, just for the sake of having too much data okay folks so that's basically the idea here so whatever data that we what whatever it is that we're collecting it should have a purpose to it as we suggested in the earlier point there should be adequate data we should uh, you know limit 
the particular data to, to the purpose that we have. And of course, we shouldn't acquire any sort of unnecessary data as well. What else? <clears throat> the data should be accurate and where required, it should be kept up to date as well. This is a really important point as well because you know, not all data that we obtain should be accurate, isn't it? There could be some sort of inaccuracies or invalid data there as well. So are we making sure as to whether the data that we're collecting is accurate? If yes, then how? Or, uh, you know, even we may have, let's say, collected a particular data on, at one point in time, but after, you know, the passage of time, it may have changed. Have we kept it up to date? That's basically another area that we have to focus on as well. And what else? Kept no longer than is necessary. Once the purpose is met or once the particular task is done, then we don't, if, if we don't have to use the data, then, you know, uh, dispose of it or uh, do whatever is necessary. That's basically it. Okay, folks, that's basically the idea here. We, we shouldn't hold the data longer than what is expected. Okay, folks, that's basically it. <clears throat> and finally, handled in a way that ensures appropriate security, including protection against unlawful or unauthorized processing, access, loss, or destruction or damage. Your personal data, it depends upon it can depend upon any sort of situation. Uh, so when you're writing a law, it should be applicable to any and every situation that's possible, isn't it? That's basically why the, uh, you know, rules are worded like this. And especially when it comes to UK related acts, uh, they're more of a, of a principle nature as well. So yeah, there's that. <clears throat> now, uh, so the idea here is that we have to make sure that there is adequate security to the data and there is no such thing as you know destruction or data laws or anything like that okay folks and it should not be transferred to unauthorized personal without the permission of if it is let's say personal details then we shouldn't transfer it to someone else without the permission of the uh, particular uh, person from which we have obtained the data from isn't it so that's basically the idea here okay folks so these are some common rules that uh, that the act uh, explicitly mentions that's basically it all it is and then there's a new concept known as corporate digital responsibility kind of similar to corporate social responsibility but on a digital platform that's basically all it is okay folks so digital corporate digital responsibility or cdr involves a commitment to protect both customers and employees and ensuring that technologies and data are used both productively and wisely that's basically all it is, isn't it? So we're just making sure that we're protecting the organization's customers as well as the employees. And why exactly is that? Because we have a duty to protect the, whatever personal information or personal data that we have of them. Okay, folks, so that's basically as to what corporate digital responsibility is all about. It's basically, you know, uh, the ethical aspect of uh, handling personal data or uh, privacy, etc. Okay, folks, that's basically all it is. And finally, we talk about ethics of big data, AI, and algorithms as well. So what's the big idea here? Let's take a look. We already talked about a few things regarding collecting the data, isn't it? As well as processing the data as well. So what exactly are the ethical issues in, in big data or artificial intelligence? So let's take a look at that. So folks, the first and foremost thing before we deep dive into this is that you have to understand what algorithms are. So what is an algorithm anyway? An algorithm is a set of rules that is uh, uh, basically coded into a computer system you know, to achieve a particular purpose, okay folks? So it's basically a set of rules which conducts certain calculations to solve a problem. That's the exact definition of it. Okay folks, that's basically all it is. And we use several algorithms to create softwares like artificial intelligence software. Okay, folks, that's basically the idea here. So we don't have, we're not gonna get too much into like computer programming or coding here, but rather we just have to have a basic idea as to what is the ethical issue here. Okay, folks, so first of all, we know as to what algorithms are. It is used to create these sort of softwares through coding and various programming activities, isn't it? We know that. So now let's read into it, shall we? Algorithms produce an outcome or answer that organizations and people may rely on for, for making a decision. So what's the idea here, guys? We use algorithms 
which is used in softwares and artificial intelligence, big data, etc. We all know that. Uh, we use algorithms to get an outcome or an answer to make a decision, isn't it? That's basically what we use it. So plainly, what we're doing is we're going to enter in some information that the software requires and get the output of it, isn't it? We provide the input and we get the output. Simple process, isn't it? But the problem is, how does this particular software get the output? We don't know that, isn't it? In most cases, even if we are providing the input, we're not sure how the output is obtained, isn't it? This particular concept is known as black box algorithms. Okay, folks, so we will provide the, you know, we provide some, uh, you know, inputs into the system, be it artificial intelligence, be it uh, data analytics softwares, be it anything. However, the output that has been obtained, we're not sure how this has been obtained, isn't it? So this is what black box algorithms is all about. However, most algorithms do not explain how they arrived at the answer or how they arrived at the output here. And this is known as black box algorithms, as simple as that. Okay, folks, this is a simple concept and this is a issue. Okay, folks, an ethical issue to be more precise. <clears throat> so how can we, again, we've uh, kind of like, you know, data solos, we've yet again identified a problem here, isn't it? So if we identify a problem, the next step would be to identify a solution. So let's talk about that. Organizations need to implement a robust strategy to manage such risks, obviously, isn't it? Minimizing the risk of, for example, human bias or technical flaws within the algorithm. Okay, so how exactly can we do that? Through explainable AI. Well, this is something that you may have already guessed from the name itself, isn't it? So it is an artificial intelligence system that explains how they, uh, you know, how they reach the outcome. That's basically all it is. Okay, folks. Now, explainable AI emphasizes the role of the algorithm, not just for providing an output, but also for sharing with the user supporting information on how it reached the conclusion. Okay. Furthermore, the idea is for this information to be available in human readable way rather than being hidden in code. So sometimes the, you know, as to the fact that how we reach the, how the particular software reach the output may be, you know, a bit coded. Okay, folks, so we can't necessarily decode it. Okay, folks, so uh, the idea behind explainable AI is that we will be explaining how we, how the software reached to that particular outcome or why they have shared information to several users or, uh, you know, it also provides us with, well, it's kind of transparent and we will be able to understand how things work within this particular system. Okay, folks, so that's basically the idea behind explainable AI. So a solution to black box algorithms would be explainable AI. Okay, folks, that's yet again, a uh, really important thing that you have to understand here. And that basically concludes the changes or the amendments that has happened to the advanced performance management paper. As for the aspects in relation to professional skills, we will definitely be practicing a lot of, you know, CBE questions, CBE specimen, as well as past paper questions within the question marathon so that you can get a better hang of it as well. Okay, folks. And of course, there will be a lot of, you know, tips and tricks being communicated to you on how to use the CBE environment efficiently or how to score the professional marks in a bit more effective manner as well. Okay, folks. So I will see you till then. This is Vishnu Vijay signing off. Thank you.